Thank you, Dr. Olenski. As we look with hope toward a post-pandemic world, it's heartening to hear that the transatlantic community is leaning in on cooperation and vaccine development. We've witnessed some amazing feats of innovation and rapid scientific response to our global health crisis over the past year. Transatlantic cooperation in scientific breakthroughs like the co-created Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine highlights just one of the many facets of this relationship. Our partnership is not based in any one policy area. In addition to traditional policy issues like trade, defense, climate, and foreign policy, we also share scientific breakthroughs, technological developments, cultural exchanges, arts, entertainment, and so much more. The transatlantic partnership is truly comprehensive. And this means that as we look to a post-COVID-19 world, we should create an agenda for recovery and growth that is inclusive and builds back better rather than the same. The pandemic has exposed inequalities and systemic challenges that were easy to ignore in a time of growth and prosperity. In a time of crisis, they become existential. How do we take the lessons learned from the past year and turn them into action? How do we build a transatlantic agenda that is holistic, that incorporates the elements of security and societal resilience that might be overlooked? I'll turn now to Benjamin Haddad, Director of the Europe Center, and Georgina Wright, Head of the Europe Program at Institute Montagna, to introduce our next distinguished guest. Thank you, Denise. I'm delighted to be here today with our uh, next speaker, a friend of the Atlantic Council, His Excellency Margaritis Sinas, Vice President of the European Commission for Promoting Our European Way of Life. Vice President Sinas has one of the widest ranging portfolios in the Commission covering everything from migration to internal security, education, and the Erasmus program. Also joining me in the conversation today to discuss how to build a more inclusive transatlantic post-pandemic agenda is Georgina Wright, head of the Europe program at Institut Montaigne, a strategic partner of the Atlantic Council. Uh, Georgina, so looking forward to uh, co-hosting this uh, discussion with you today. Um, maybe first, uh, let me open with a, a couple questions before I, I turn to uh, Georgina. Uh, Vice President Sinas, thanks for uh, joining us. I want to ask you first maybe about the news of the day, um, of the last couple of days. The Biden administration has uh, announced that it supported lifting uh, patents on uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, we just came out of a really interesting conversation about transatlantic cooperation and recovery on, on COVID, uh, what is the position of the European Commission on this, uh, this debate? Uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you for, uh, for having me. Delighted to, to be again in the company of the Atlantic Council of, of the transatlantic community. Um, let me also add to your introduction that uh, part of my uh, turf in the Commission is also to oversee public health. Uh, so that's uh, also part of, of this rather extensive brief of the Vice Presidency for promoting the European way of life. Coming straight to your first question, I think uh, that from the European Union point of view, uh, no one doubts that we are at the forefront of effective deliveries of vaccines to the world not only through COVAX, but also as a major exporter of vaccines from the European Union to the rest of the world. We're very proud that we have so far exported 200 million doses to the world, as much as we delivered for our own member states. Our priority is to ramp up production so that we can achieve global vaccination as soon as possible. But at the same time, we are open to discuss any other idea, any other suggestion that would contribute to pragmatic solutions. So we are ready to assess the US proposal to see how it will help quickly promote this goal of global vaccination. But in the short term, what we really, really need is to export. So we call upon all vaccines uh, producing countries to export immediately as much as they can so that we can avoid disrupting the global supply chains of vaccines that are so crucial in the current juncture. 
uh, Gulf for exports. I think that's that's very important. I want to ask you about the, the broader societal implications of the crisis that this entire world has been going through for the last year. And I would say it's fair to say that every country has failed in its own way. And you know, we're talking about the vaccination campaign now in the United States, but obviously it wasn't a victory lab just a few months ago. And so I want to ask you about the lessons learned as we as we start to look at the end of this crisis, uh, you're in charge of promoting our European way of life. What do you think this crisis has revealed about our European way of life? And what are the, the lessons that the EU will have to learn from it? Well, the, f the first lesson I think to be drawn is that no member state in the European Union could have coped with the magnitude of this uh, crisis alone rich or poor, north or south, east or west, small or big, there would be no member state that could have done a better job in facing the pandemic than the one that we are doing together as a union. That's the first lesson drawn. The second lesson is that uh, at times of crisis is where Europe is doing well. Or, or said otherwise, uh, uh, for Europeans, uh, we, we never allow a crisis to go wasted. <laughs> and because within this tragedy of the pandemic, with so many thousands of people lost, there is a positive step, there is a positive uh, lesson to be drawn, that we took unprecedented steps as a union. We, we crossed the Rubicon in a way, by doing things that would have been unimaginable few few years or months ago, like for example, uh, buying collectively and implementing uh, the the biggest vaccination program in in in, in history, uh, in an area where, as you know, public health is one is not one of the strongest competencies of the European Union according to the treaty, or activating this. Uh, uh, super weapon of a European recovery and resilience fund that would allow us to cope symmetrically to the pandemic shock of the economy, whilst at the same time adjusting to the twin transition towards a greener and more digital Europe. And the third lesson, I think, would be uh, that uh, uh, we found out, uh, probably again through the crisis, that. Uh, the call for European strategic autonomy is more urgent and present than ever, especially in the first weeks of the pandemic. All of a sudden, uh, we Europeans discovered that we do not produce masks anymore, that uh, there are no many ventilators being produced in Europe, that our member states were fighting each other for, for things that would have thought that were commodities in Europe. So this call for strategic autonomy from raw materials to key areas, to industry, to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, whatever we need to build our own resilience in the future. I think this is the third lesson of the pandemic that you, Europe learned uh, the tough way, but I think we learned this lesson too. Thank you. Let me turn to uh, Georgina Wright uh, from Paris. Thank you, Ben. Um, Vice President, it's really interesting to listen to some, some of your reflections in you know, this pandemic and how the EU dealt with it. Now, you're no stranger to Brussels. You've spent time you know, as an official inside the European Commission. You were, I think, a member of the European Parliament briefly, and then, of course, um, Vice President. Um, but my question really is, is on communications. You know, do you think the EU could have done a better job? in communicating what it's done so far, what it is doing, um, and also how it might be able to change that in the future? Well, uh, as you rightly point out, Georgina, uh, there is no perfect recipe for communication. Communication is, is a permanent stream of, of success and failure, and, and I think it, it's inevitable. Communication reflects a bit reality. So be, before discussing communication, let's see the substance uh, of, of what really happened that led to, to uh, problems in communication. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, European vaccination uh, program, uh, early January, uh, we faced uh, with, uh, with a, a myth, a perception that uh, spread very quickly across Europe, that uh, according to which all Europeans 
would have to be vaccinated at the same time with the same jab. <laughs> so uh, we failed to explain that the EU vaccination program was a sequence of deployments of uh, vaccines approved by the European Medicines Agency, our regulator, that would come into a system throughout the first semester of this year. So the, the perception was, where are the vaccines for the people? And, and people wanted to have the full deployment of vaccines within the first month. And I think it was a mistake, probably uh, a mistake that uh, in hindsight uh, we now understand, but we could have or should have explained better that this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And, and proof of that is that the European Vaccines Marathon is now working and we're fully on target to have uh, full immunity for the general population uh, uh, in the summer. The second difficulty we faced was that we discovered that one of the companies from which we uh, purchased uh, a considerable amount of doses and prepaid uh, simply uh, failed to deliver uh, the contractual obligations that they assumed with us. And this is serious. This is important. This is something probably that we should have uh, explained much more aggressively uh, rather than assuming it as, as, uh, as a fact. Um, now uh, we are having a legal uh, injunction against this company, as you probably know, I'm talking about AstraZeneca, we are in the Belgian uh, court system and we hope to get the vaccine doses that uh, we still, uh, that the company still owes us. But I think to come back to your question, the, 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 the problems we had with communication related to, the, to, to these two difficulties, objective difficulties, that in a way dominated uh, European public opinion. And we failed to counter this with a Brussels narrative because we didn't get much support in the member states either. I think member states were also part of this counter narrative, but okay, we are used to it. We are used to the nationalization of success and Europeanization of problems. This is a pattern that we know uh, by now well. Great. Ben, I, I had a follow up question, if I may, um, uh, following up on that, you know, the, your portfolio, as Ben said, is, is hugely broad um, and it actually tries to touch many people in society who don't potentially watch every twist and turn that happens in Brussels. So when we're thinking about sort of promoting a European way of life post COVID in this green economy and all these big flagship projects that are happening in Brussels, how do you see your role in particular in sort of articulating and putting forward that very positive agenda? Georgina, my portfolio, which is uh, new, it's a, it's a new job, that there was no function, there was no portfolio of this kind in, in the Commission so far, is a direct, I think, response by, by President van der Leyen to the uh, by now famous speech by Emmanuel Macron in Sorbonne, where he called for a Europe that protects and a Europe that empowers. And he said on the Europe that protects side, we need strong policies where people feel protected in, in public health, in migration, border security. And on the Europe that empowered side, we need policies that open up opportunities, that create possibilities for mobility, for growth, for, for Europeans to discover each other, to understand each other through culture, education, uh, sport, uh, uh, skills. So bringing together under this single roof of, of uh, the promotion of European way of life, these families of policies, it's a fantastic challenge for, for this commission and for me personally. And um, in post-pandemic times, um, okay, the twin transitions, green and digital are, are not with me. The green is with uh, uh, Vice President uh, Timmermans and the digital is with uh, Margrethe Vestager. But I, I like to think of, of my job as the most anthropocentric uh, job in the commission. Um, and, and in these post pandemic times, we have to give people, we have to give Europeans this certainty that Europe works for them, both as a shield 
as a bouclier, as you would call it in, in, in French, but at the same time as a spear, as, as, as an opportunity, as, as, as a leader to do much more together in, 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 in these key areas that I'm referring to. So uh, yes, uh, this anthropocentric portfolio uh, is, is very much challenging for, for the months and years to come. Uh, especially because our way of life has been severely uh, uh, challenged, shaken, threatened. But it's interesting to note that Europe coped our public health and public education systems withstood the pressure of this crisis. Our societies proved more solidarity and resilience and helping to the most vulnerable. We managed to bring together elements of work that have not been activated before. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, that we can do even better in the future. I don't know, Georgina, do you want to continue? I, well, I can pick it up. I mean, there's a, you, you talked about strategic autonomy uh, and as one of the key lessons of uh, this crisis and uh, mentioned President Macron's speech at Sorbonne. And uh, obviously this also happened in the context of a very different American administration that was uh, showing a sense of, of European loneliness as well. Uh, we're at the first few months of a Biden administration that's proclaiming that America is back and has put alliances at the heart of its uh, message. Obviously this is the uh, EU-US forum. Uh, I, I wanna ask you, how do you articulate this call for strategic autonomy uh, within the transatlantic alliance. This is, uh, let's be honest, a term that's not often very well understood here in, uh, in Washington, D.C., but it can also be, I think, an asset for the alliance. How would you, how would you articulate the two? Let me uh, start with a personal, uh, on a personal note. Uh, in the last five years, uh, in my previous capacity as uh, chief spokesperson for the European Commission, I attended together with President Juncker all G7 and, and G20 summits um, uh, in the last five years. So I, I had the first chance experience to feel um, uh, lonely, <laughs> or to put it differently. Uh, during these five years, uh, European, the European Union did not have a dancing partner in, in the dance of multilateralism. We felt very alone. And um, during these occasions, which are, as you know, the, the occasions of where global governance leaders meet, very often we would hear from uh, others, uh, the Australians, the Brazilians, Chinese sometimes, even the Japanese, uh, telling us, uh, thank God you guys are around. <laughs> so that, that showed that to, to many of our international partners, during these five years, without the United States being next to us, Europe was representing, uh, how should I put this, uh, an anchor of stability <laughs> or, uh, or a beacon of, of light, if you like, in a world that sounded very, very dark. Now, we are delighted that we do have uh, a partner uh, in the transatlantic ball. We are delighted that uh, the new Biden administration is engaging uh, very quickly uh, on all European fronts, uh, from, from climate change to security, to uh, the economy, to trade, to, to, to health. This is uh, a delight, this is fantastic. But at the same time, uh, I don't think that this call for European strategic autonomy should be interpreted as something that would threaten this uh, retrouvaille between uh, us and the Americans. On the contrary, I think that uh, 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 the European strategic autonomy in key areas would add to the strength of the transatlantic bond. Uh, I think that our American friends would like Europe to be resilient, solid, um, sufficient in, in, in key areas that uh, we need. And this is not, will not be done against the, 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 the American interests. In certain areas like security, like digital, like artificial intelligence, like 5G, there is so much that we can do together. But part of this 
much, <laughs> new much to do, would have to, to transit through the improvement of the European autonomy. And this will not be, again, a game of protectionism. We are not full. We have 35 billion jobs in Europe depending from, the, uh, from, from exports. And we will not risk any of these jobs and we will not risk our global part in, in the, our part in global trade uh, uh, in the name of, uh, of uh, this autonomy. So uh, I would like to seize this opportunity to transmit uh, 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 a message of uh, uh, keep cool and, and keep engaging. This is not a threat. This is something that helps. Keep cool and keep engaging. I think that's uh, that could be a good slogan for the entire uh, future forum. Georgina. Thank you, Ben. Um, Vice President, obviously, you know, what you've just outlined is a key strategic interest for both sides. But again, going back to your portfolio, thinking about inclusion, uh, what is there, you know, in terms of an agenda that the US and the EU can push together to make sure that they're really reaching all those people who may not be following every twist and turn in Washington DC and Brussels, who may actually, and who are most certainly, you know, impacted by decisions there and could have their voice listened to if they wanted to. How can you, you know, the US and the EU work together to really promote an inclusive agenda? Yeah, uh, th that's also very timely. There I see a, 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 a twin uh, approach, a two track approach on, I think it is vital that the uh, on the economic recovery side both in the us and in the eu we make sure that we leave no one behind in the much needed recovery effort that is about to start uh, let us uh, i mean have no doubt i think that uh, we are about to to witness a major boom uh, in growth uh, and expansion in demand and it's, it's very important in both sides of the Atlantic that our stimuli, our, our big stimulus programs, uh, your Biden package and our recovery plan work in, in, in full synchronization, uh, not only helping people uh, come back, switch back to growth, but making sure that we leave no one behind. That's key. I think this is a key uh, element of, of inclusion. And then the other track, is again the anthropocentric approach I was referring to earlier. Both the Americans and us, uh, we share the same values. We are vibrant democracies. We have a long tradition of inclusion and fairness. We have, uh, we are the uh, world's epicenter of, of good governance, of human rights, of, of uh, Privacy, well, we're doing a bit better, I think, in privacy than, than the, the American, our American friends. But still, I mean, human rights, uh, th th there is such a wealth of political and social key that binds us, uh, that, that reinforces the, trans the transatlantic bond. So I think that in, as part of this inclusion drive that will follow the post-pandemic times, this tr second track, of, of making sure that our values, our systems, our democracies, our rules uh, are, are uh, fit for purpose, that would be equally important. Not only on the recovery side, but also on the societal part. I, uh, let me ask you uh, maybe a last question on a, uh, on a lighter note, although I, I, I do think it's a really interesting and important topic, you and I are both uh, football fans and I'm in the United States, I still call it football. Uh, and I saw that you were uh, very vocal in opposing the project of the, the Super League. And uh, I, I wanna ask you about this, but I also ask you about how that reflects a certain attachment to the European way of life. And maybe in this respect to a different way of approaching sport and society between uh, the United States and uh, the European Union. Yes, Ben, I, I appreciate your interest in, in sport and in football. After all, you, you are a European uh, accidentally uh, spending some time in, 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 in the States. I hope we'll get you back uh, soon. Uh, yes, uh, th there is something that is called the European model of sport. And we all know what this is. This is kids playing football in every village of the continent. 
small teams, uh, volunteer teams, soccer moms, um, small clubs, uh, and even middle clubs aspiring to play uh, with uh, the top ones. There is an element of diversity, but also uniqueness in this European model of sport where national competitions play a role um, of a filter to a broader European competition where everybody can aspire, everybody can play according to our values and our, our way of life. Compare that to a project where 12 top clubs, mainly owned by non-European owners, decide to play amongst themselves forever, sharing an annual budget of 5 billion euros for themselves, uh, severing any link with uh, amateur football, national competition. How European is this? This is not European. And this is not our way of life. We, we reacted very formally and very strongly. I'm very happy to see that we were not alone. And I, I must say that in, in my many years of uh, experience in working the European meanders, I never saw such a degree of consensus uh, against something like the one we saw in on opposition uh, to the Super League. So yes, uh, we continue to be against these projects of the rich and powerful who, who, who are targeting the, the, the rest of us. And yes, we will continue to defend a European model of sport that we know, that we like, and we want to see prosper. Well, very glad that didn't go through. Uh, uh, Vice President Sinas, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to host you again uh, at the Atlantic Council. Thank you so much for joining the EU-US Future Forum, and uh, we hope to uh, see you soon in person in uh, Washington, D.C. And thank, thank you, you Georgina, for our joining us. Thank you. And let me turn it uh, now back to uh, RMC uh, Denise Verstuber. <laughs>